All right, welcome back to uh, the second part of the uh, three sub-video uh, lectures on uh, interplanetary mission planning. So obviously, last time we, uh, we talked about the uh, sphere of influence model of the uh, solar system and what allows us to approximate our motion, which is really a four-body problem, with a uh, with uh, really three two-body problems, All right? So remember, leaving the sphere of influence of the Earth, right? And so here's the Earth, here's the Earth. Leaving, we have a mo uh, we have a conic around the Earth, then we've got the Sun. We've got a conic around the Sun, and then we've got uh, the arrival planet. And we have a, another conic around the arrival planet. These are all conics. So hyperbole or ellipses. So uh, this will be obviously be an ellipse. Uh, this will be initially a, an ellipse and then a hyperbola. And uh, depending on what you do when you arrive, this will be initially a hyperbola and um, might stay a hyperbola, um, but it also might transition to an ellipse if you want to, if you want to stay. All right. So um, I've broken down the, the conical parts of this into uh into into to several pieces i've got six pieces here right um and i'll talk about them each individually with the delta v's that we use and these delta v's are going to be pretty much the same application we had in what was that lecture um lecture eight i think uh, so, pre so pretty much home and transfers, uh, escape maneuvers, and, and so forth. But just applications of what we've already learned. Right? And so, uh, so we'll go through these piece by piece. They're, we're not going to be learning anything new uh, per se, but we'll be sort of applying what we knew already in sort of uh, new and interesting ways. Uh, so, right... Uh, these are the stages, right, of uh, a mission plan, um, starting with uh, establishing yourself in orbit around the Earth, parking orbit, preferably in the ecliptic plane, because remember, planetary motion occurs in the ecliptic plane, so if you want to go to another planet, typically you transition to the ecliptic, pla ecliptic plane and then, and then do your, your motion there. You can avoid that, but uh, you know, that's not something we're going to discuss. Uh, so we position ourselves in the ecliptic plane. Uh, so starting with an ellipse, uh, we'll burn to escape velocity, right? Escape velocity. And we're going to go beyond escape velocity. Right? So beyond, some, some, somehow beyond. We'll use the Oberth effect to help us here, and we'll talk about that in a second. So that once we leave the sphere of influence of the Earth, we have some excess velocity. Right. Right. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, um, that transition point, right? the patch points, right? Uh, and the patch points are important because uh, at that point, we, we, when we transition from uh, ECI, Earth-centered inertial coordinates, to heliocentric coordinates, right? Uh, we have to subtract the velocity of the Earth, right? The velocity of the Earth becomes important. And the direction we're going with respect to the Earth becomes important uh, for that patch point to determine what's our, what's our velocity in the heliocentric frame. So the velocity in the ECI becomes a new velocity 
uh, in the heliocentric frame, which is the old velocity plus or minus uh, the excess velocity. Sorry, that that's equal to that. Okay. Uh, once we're in the heliocentric frame, we propagate out, right? That's, uh, let's see, this part of the ellipse. Uh, so we propagate out to the planet using a pretty standard home and transfer usually. Uh, and in this class, we're only going to be talking about home and transfers. Um, so uh, that's, uh, this is going on there. Uh, and then when we get there, in this case, we're going to be talking about Venus, so an inner planet. Inner planets and outer planets are a little bit different. Uh, and then we'll also have some relative velocity with respect. We'll transition. We'll do that patch point. And so when after the patch, when we go from heliocentric to Venus-centric coordinate systems, uh, then we'll have to find our relative velocity with respect to Venus. Right. And, uh, and then we calculate our, our conic with respect to Venus, which is this hyperbola, right? uh, which you can't see. Oh, sorry, I like bother. Right. Um, so we go hyperbola to an ellipse. Right. So at the patch, we have a hyperbolic. We, we're in an elliptic orbit with respect to Sun. At the patch, we go to a hyperbolic orbit with respect to Venus. And then if we want to stay at Venus, we, we have to hit an elliptic orbit somehow. So for insertion. And that insertion, that patch point, is going to be determined by our called targeting radius. That'll determine our periapse with respect to Venus. And then we can either fly by Venus or we can do a burn and, uh, and um, we'll do a burn and stay in, in Venus orbit. So, or if we don't, we, we'll, we can do a gravity assist. But that's next, next sub-lecture. Right, so we'll go through all of these topics. Um, again, the, there's not much mathematics. I mean, the mathematics are fairly straightforward, so hopefully this will be relatively easy. So here's our, uh, our, our, our problem, right? So we want to go from Earth to Venus, right? So Earth to Venus, so that's, uh, first of all, we notice that's an inner planet. So we'll be uh, in the, here's Earth radius, here's Venus radius, here's the Sun. So we're going to be going, right, patching in like that. So, sorry, bad drawing. And, of course, half of it's blocked out. So sorry about that, too. Um, yeah. So anyway, we want to get to Venus. We're going to rendezvous with Venus. Uh, and then we're going to insert. And we're going to establish ourselves in a, uh, a Venus orbit. It's going to be a posi-grade orbit, which means uh, counterclockwise. Haven't talked about that much. Because remember, the planets are all moving counterclockwise. Right? Planets are moving counterclockwise. Earth is moving counterclockwise. Uh, our initial orbit will be counterclockwise. And then when we get into orbit, we can either be going, that's a posi-grade orbit counterclockwise. Shoot. I don't know why I keep putting things up there. Um, so, let's see, get here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so when we insert, right, we want to, we can go be going counterclockwise, and that's a posi-grade orbit. Or we could be going counterclockwise, which is a uh, retrograde orbit. Right. 
Um, okay. So, but we're not there yet. We're, we're still in, at now in, in Earth orbit. Right. So here's the, uh, uh, the e equatorial, right? This is the equator of the Earth. Uh, and to get to the other planets, we need to be in the ecliptic. except for the moon, which as we discussed, has its own sort of weird uh, inclination. So there's the moon maybe. The moon is, uh, remember, five degrees off of the ecliptic, but it can be plus or minus. Right? Uh, so we got the other planets. So we need to get, when we do our transition, our patch point, uh, we, it needs to be in the ecliptic plane, right? Uh, So our first step then, well, obviously we want to establish a parking orbit, right? Uh, but we want that parking orbit to have a particular inclination of, uh, of uh, 21 degrees uh, in this case, or 23 degrees. Right? Because the inclination uh, to the ecliptic is 23 degrees. We're not in the ecliptic plane. We're going to head off into deep space, right? So normally maneuvers in space, deep space are, are, are the normal. Normally maneuvers getting to planets are in the ecliptic. If you get off the ecliptic, uh, you're in the middle of nowhere, right? So here's all our planets, things like that. I mean, you don't want to be up here. lost in space. Right. Uh, anyway, so uh, we want to establish a, uh, a parking orbit, which is 23 degrees inclined. Uh, fortunately, that's less than most launch sites, so it's, it's doable. Um, the uh, circular orbit, uh, we're going to start with a, a radius of uh, three, uh, 200 kilometer altitude. So that's our first step. Um, so here again, here's the same picture, right? Uh, inclination of the ecliptic is 23 degrees. Um, so you need to get into the ecliptic plane. You need your orbital plane of your parking orbit to be in the ecliptic plane. So the first step is then, of course, to get into the ecliptic plane. So uh, what, what, how is the ecliptic plane defined? Well, uh, okay, so first of all, uh, what is the inclination? I, well, that's 23 degrees, uh, 23.5, I think I said on the other one. Um, also, right, uh, we have to make sure that our right ascension, right, is... What? What do we need our right ascension to be? Uh, well, mm, where does the ecliptic plane intersect the equatorial plane? And what angle does that make with the first point of Aries? And here's first point of Aries. I think I'll change my color here. Doo, 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 doo. Purple. Okay. Um, all right, so the, uh, the first point of Aries, I'm gonna make that brush here a little bit smaller. So I can draw um, better. So what is the, here's the first point of Aries, right? What's the right ascension with respect to the first point of Aries? Well, the it's right ascension by definition of the ecliptic plane uh, is zero degrees because the right ascension is defined as the intersection of the ecliptic plane and the equatorial plane at, um, uh, at, at the ascending node. Um, so now if we draw our orbit here, obviously 
all orbits pass through the ecliptic plane. Here's an orbit, all right. So all orbits will hit that ecliptic plane at some point, say this point here, but that intersection may not occur at uh, um, a convenient point. So, right, so uh, here's, our, here's our intersection with the ecliptic plane. Now, if you launch correctly and at the right time, um, then remember you can choose your, your, your right ascension uh, and your inclination just based on launch time, uh, based on your launch window and uh, the launch site. So that was a lecture, I don't know, it was some lecture. Um, plane change maneuvers, I think it was lecture nine, lecture nine. If I had a live student's audience, you might look it up and correct me, but I'm going to hope that it's lecture nine. Um, so, so uh, well, okay, how are we gonna do this, right? Uh, so first of all, we want to insert into the into the ecliptic plane at the ascending node. So when we're moving below, so here I think we've got, uh, pretend this is you, not the moon. Right. So here's our orbit, right? And here's the equator. This is our initial right ascension. Right. Um, here's the ecliptic plane. Uh, here is our intersection. It's at the ascending node, right? And uh, so we may, if this is our point of intersection, we may want to do a delta V burn there to place ourselves in the ecliptic plane. Uh, hold on, wait, that's not right. In the ecliptic plane that way, right? So we may need a little plane change maneuver. Maneuver. So the, we need our right ascension after the plane change maneuver to be uh, zero degrees. Uh, and we need our uh, inclination in the, uh, the, uh, in the, in, of the new orbit to be 23.27 degrees. So again, lecture nine question mark, because I'm not absolutely sure about that. Uh, so again, right, uh, ecliptic. Orbit, initial orbit. We know how to calculate uh, plane change maneuvers using spherical geometry. Uh, specifically, the uh, plane change we require based on spherical geometry for moving from one orbit to another uh, is based on the initial right ascension uh, the initial inclination the desired final inclination which is 23.5 degrees or 23 23.5 degrees uh, which is the same as this, of course. Yeah, maybe get a different color. And uh, the desired uh, final right ascension, which is zero degrees. So uh, this is zero, this is uh, 23, this is uh, 23, and this is, uh, this is whatever we launched into. So there's a plane change maneuver using this formula uh, just given here based on uh, those numbers. So the only things that will change here are uh, this number, that's the same number, and this number. Yeah. 
So for example, uh, Kennedy is at uh, 28 degrees. Uh, so your uh, minimum inclination from Kennedy is 28 degrees. Right. Uh, we can choose our launch time to achieve any right ascension. So we could choose, uh, let's say, omega one equals zero. Choose omega one equals zero. Choose our, our I one equals 28.5 degrees. Um, and so we just plug those numbers into the formula here, right? Uh, so there's that no change there. Um, yeah, it plugs in there, it plugs in there. We get these from the ecliptic, All right? And so we calculate that number, and it's a it's a delta it's a it's a five degree plane change. So not a huge plane change uh, if we do things correctly. Um, of course, Kennedy uh, uh, is a is 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 a good launch site. There are higher latitude launch sites where you need larger plane changes. Lower launch sites where you can launch into any inclination you like. Um, and then, of course, right, where in the burn, we had another formula for, for that, uh, for when we do this delta V maneuver. And this is also from lecture nine, I believe. So again, uh, the formulae are just the same. Uh, this is uh, initial inclination that's known. This is the five degrees we talked about earlier. We already calculated that. Uh, the only, uh, so this uh, only thing we need to know is that, the final inclination, which is 23.5 degrees. And so uh, we just plug these, uh, these numbers in, right? And then that gives us our uh, where, at what time, we need to do our, 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 our delta V burn. Right. And this, of course, is the argument of periapse, which is, depends on your initial orbit. And the, uh, the delta V required for a plane change maneuver, again, right from lecture nine, uh, is just this one, two V sine theta over two. Uh, that's for a pure plane change. If you can get your timing right, right? If you can get your timing right, you can, you can make this, this plane change burn almost negligible, right? Uh, because you combine uh, your your plane change maneuver with your escape burn, and we'll talk about the escape burn in a second. All right, but so if we did that right, here's uh, v of our parking orbit. All right, so that's v for your parking orbit. It's going to be about I don't know what seven kilometers a second. All right, uh, so. If you uh, combine your, your plane change, five degrees in this case, with a, uh, a burn to escape, uh, so V escape plus a little bit. We'll talk about that in a second. So that'll be around, uh, let's say 11 kilometers per second. Uh, then, uh, so obviously these aren't to scale, but that's seven, let's say. And so, uh, delta V. So the di then the difference between the delta V just for uh, the burn to escape and the delta V for burn plus plane change is almost the same. It's almost just V escape minus V park. So you can really this plane change maneuver if you time it right, and you know that's a, that is always a bit of a challenging, uh, but you need so you need the timing right. Uh, you can almost eliminate that delta V just by combining it with the escape maneuver. Yep. Um, and of course, if you can, obviously better to launch directly into ecliptic plane. If 
the launch side is below 23 degrees. So now, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's preliminaries. Now we, of course, want to make that patch point, um, talk about transitions from the Earth-centered inertial to the uh, heliocentric coordinate system. So this is the transition from ECI at the sphere of influence to the heliocentric coordinate system. Right. So at the what happens at this at this patch point? Right. So what happens is we transition coordinate systems. Right. So the coordinate system. So the problem is, of course, that the Earth is moving in the heliocentric coordinate system at a velocity v uh, Earth. Right. Um, let's see, um, where do I have the velocity of the earth here somewhere? Um, okay, I don't. All right, so sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, so the earth is moving with respect to the sun at a velocity v earth, right? And so when you make that transition, right, v in the heliocentric coordinate systems, right, uh, is equal to the velocity uh, with respect to Earth of U plus the velocity of the Earth with respect to the Sun. Right. So you get to add this, the velocity of the Earth to your velocity vector, right? So after you've escaped. So now assume you've escaped, right? Um, you have some excess velocity with respect to the Earth. And <clears throat> what, does, what do you want that velocity to be? So after the patch point, right? So what do we want our velocity to be after the patch point? Right, so after we've transitioned to the heliocentric coordinates, what do we want our velocity to be? Um, so it's sort of interesting. You can think of like the Earth, right? If you're at the Earth, right? You're at the, on the Earth. You can think of the Earth as a parking orbit itself, right? Earth is your parking orbit. Right. You know, Earth is your parking board orbit. Like, how do you transit to out of your parking orbit? We well, got to give it some delta v. Uh, and so, delta v in that case is your excess velocity, the velocity after you've left the sphere of the influence of the Earth. We'll talk about that in a second. Right. Uh, and so we want v e plus delta v to be uh, the velocity of the home and transfer orbit, right, at your, at your departure, right? So in this case, actually, it's a little bit non-standard because we're going to Venus. Venus is an inner planet, meaning its orbit is, is below that of the Earth, its radius. So we're actually like gonna decrease our, our energy in this case. Um, and so if we think of the home and transfer orbit, um, Let's see, yeah. well, here's a home and transfer. Uh, we want an ellipse. We want that home and transfer ellipse uh, with uh, a radius of apogee, right? Our initial radius is actually our apogee radius of the radius of the Earth, or actually I should say not the radius of the Earth, but the distance from the Earth to the Sun and our periapse, right, that's going to be our second distance, uh, equal to the distance from Venus to the Sun, right? Right. 
So, of course, we can calculate then of uh, or, or a semi-major axis of this transfer. A Hohmann is a uh, RP plus RA divided by two is distance uh, to Venus plus distance to Earth divided by two. Uh, actually, we skip that step in here. Uh, we just go straight to these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, remember, velocity of periaps and velocity of apoaps formulae that we used in the home and transfer. I think that was lecture um, seven, I don't know, eight, maybe, something like that. And we have these formula. Use them on the exam, hopefully. Um, right. Right. And here... Uh, here, actually, I'm using a slightly different notation, right? So this, uh, that's, uh, I was saying, distance from the Earth to, uh, to, to the, from the Sun to the Earth, and this is distance uh, from the Sun to Venus, right there. Distance Sun to Venus, Sun to Earth, Sun to Earth, Sun to Earth, right? So these are, this is a Hohmann transfer in the Sun in the heliocentric coordinates, right? And so obviously, of course, mu is that of the Sun. And I forget that number, it's large. It's not, um, not, actually, I forgot the one for the Earth. No, I'll, I'll remember that soon enough. Um, all right, so we can calculate the velocity that we want in the heliocentric coordinate systems. Heliocentric coordinate system. Uh, after departing the Earth, and at arrival at Venus, right? So this, uh, this V2 plus, um, right, is our V apogee, right? And this V infinity Earth is our excess velocity. Right? After we've left the sphere of influence of the Earth, right? And this is the velocity of the Earth. Right, so we uh, we're just applying this formula here, right? That's um, this is velocity. Oops, sorry, I'm off the screen. Uh, this is uh, this is velocity uh, two minus, right? That's the uh, velocity of the Earth. Uh, we want this. We actually want this to go in the opposite direction, so it'll have a negative sign. Uh, that's our excess velocity. And that'll give us our desired v apogee. Right. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, this number here, right? So we want that to be, uh, or, or we want after we leave the sphere of influence to the, of the Earth to have a velocity of twenty-seven point three kilometers. And when we get to Venus, we'll have a heliocentric velocity of thirty-seven kilometers per second. Um, So that's uh, so then that's the velocity we want when we re left the Earth, and the question is, well, we had that sine issue. Do we want our velocity with respect to Earth to be positive or negative? Right, and for that we get to we choose well. Uh, the, the timing of our departure matters. When we leave the Earth's sphere of influence uh, matters. Because remember, we're, the Earth is moving that way. We're moving around the Earth like that. So if we depart at this point, we'll be going that way. If we depart at that point, we'll be going that way. Right, so we're, now we, we get to discuss that in a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, here's just some numbers. Uh, again, you know, reminder uh, that this is an approximation. Um, Right. We assume that we've sort of instantaneously left the sphere of influence of the Earth. Let's say there's Mercury, uh, Venus, Earth, Mars. So I guess this is a trip. A trip from um, this is a trip from uh, Mars to Mercury for some reason. I'm not sure why we're doing that, but that's that's what it is. Um, right. So we assume we sort of like af after we do our burn to, ex to, to escape, uh, we're instantly in the sphere of influence of the Earth. That's a reasonable assumption, again, because this, this size of the sphere of influence of the Earth, say, is only 0.5% of the distance here. 
So 0.5% of distance to the Earth. Right. So that's uh, just saying that the, the Hohmann transfer works because we, we leave the Earth's sphere of influence rather quickly. Uh, and again, none of the transitions here are Hohmann transfers. Uh, this phasing is important. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so basically, you can only get one Hohmann transfer because you have to get the planets have to be lined up right, right? So, you, the so if you're going uh, to uh, uh, to Venus, for example, from the Earth, right? Venus has to be there when you get there, right? So you gotta you gotta time that that transition, right? Oops, that's a terrible plot. Sorry about that. Um, here's my dude. I can do better. I will do better. Uh, here's let's say we're going to Mars, right? So here's Earth, right? Here's your Hohmann. Uh, and then when you get to the, you know, arrive at the end of your Hohmann, uh, you need to make sure that Mars is there when you arrive. So these are supposed to be the same point. I don't know. Make sure your planet is going to be there when you arrive. And so you got to get this relative position right so that uh, transit of Mars has, so the transit of Mars uh, during one half of the period of the Hohmann transfer. Now Mars is moving a little bit forward, fat, slower than Earth, right? So it's slower than your Hohmann transfer. So uh, so the, this angle will be positive, right? So Venus would have the opposite. Uh, Venus, you'd have to. Venus would have to be here. So if you wanted, if you're going to Venus, right? Venus is moving quicker than you. Uh, so here's, so Venus would be here. Anyway, guys, so you got to get this phasing right. So, uh, uh, so you really, you only you only get one shot at the Hohmann transfer. You have to get wait years. Well, a year basically. There's one shot a year to get to get to, get to Mars or to Venus. So if you're on a if you're on a big tour of the solar system, right, you can only use Hohmann transfer once. Um, okay. So what are we, what am I doing here? All right, so now, uh, now we really what we're going to do is we want to calculate the excess velocity, right? Um, so how do we do that? Well, okay, uh, we know that the Earth. How fast is the Earth moving? So that's v e. So the Earth is moving at about thirty kilometers per second in the heliocentric frame. And so if we want our apogee velocity uh, to be, uh, what do we want it to be? 27.29. Um, right. Uh, so if we want our apogee velocity to be 27.29 and the Earth is moving at 30, right? Uh, so we need our velocity after departure with respect to the Earth to be equal to uh, 30 minus 27.29, right? which is gives us uh, 2.5 kilometers per second or thereabouts. Well, okay, right. I feel bad because it's not 30, it's like 29.78. Okay, fine, there, perfect. Uh, 2.5 kilometers per second. 2.49 kilometers per second, fine. Uh, anyway, so you will need your velocity with respect to the Earth to be uh, 2.5 kilometers per second after you've left the sphere of influence. So that means the excess velocity of your orbit with respect to the Earth uh, should be equal to 2.5. Now the direction, of course, we want it to be negative. So we want it to be moving opposite direction of the Earth 
Uh, so that's going to be determined by the timing. If we depart on the light side or dark side. So, um, okay, forget the timing for now. Um, let's just figure out how much burn do we need to get that excess velocity of 2.5 kilometers per second. Uh, so how to get here, how to make that patch point, right? How to get from the sphere of influence of the Earth, right? So we, this is the parking orbit. Yeah. I really need to work on my like Wacom writing skills. Parking orbit. Right. The parking orbit. Uh, here's the edge of the sphere of influence of Earth. And how do we make sure, what velocity do we need here? So that when we get here, our velocity will be 2.5 kilometers per second. Right. Uh, so this is called excess velocity, right? Excess velocity. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, energy calculations. In fact, actually, this is lecture one, two. Uh, so that means, remember, after we've left the sphere of influence, right, our energy is uh, V squared over 2 minus mu over R. But after we left the sphere of influence, our R is infinity, and so our potential energy is zero. And so this is just made up by excess velocity. Right. So <clears throat> we have a, a relatively straightforward energy calculation where we just calculate the energy at the patch point, right? Uh, which is one half V infinity squared. So. And then we just uh, use conservation of energy to determine that uh, our velocity at departure should also be equal to 2.2 kilometers a second, to, to 2, positive 2. Positive 2. Put a plus there just to remind us that normally when you're in elliptic orbits, right, energy is um, negative. Right. So... Uh, we got to do a burn here to move us from a right, parking orbit, which has negative energy, to a hyperbolic orbit, which has, oh, sorry, not energy, not velocity, which has energy of positive two, right? So how much, how do we, how do we impart that energy? Now, remember, it's not that hard because we get to use the Oberth effect. Right. When we start in a low parking orbit, delta Vs at low orbit uh, count a lot more towards energy than ones at high orbit. So we get to use, uh, use Oberth to make up the difference. So the calculations, right? Uh, so initial velocity, right, is that. That's a velocity of a parking orbit, velocity of a circular orbit at radius uh, 6578, right? Velocity of a parking orbit. Uh, the velocity after your parking orbit is uh, velocity after your parking orbit, after your burn. 
is v park plus delta v. That's your variable, of course. That's what you want to find. Okay. Um, so, right, if we want the energy after our burn to be plus 2.067, right, plus 2, uh, we want the energy at after burn to be also plus 2, energy conservation. Uh, that means, well, what is not, is not known here? Known, this is 6578. Uh, this is 398600. Hey, I remembered it. This is the Earth, of course. Um, and so the only uh, unknown here is, right, this delta V. Right? Everything else is known. And so then we just solve for the delta V. We, we plug it in, right? So um, we solve for delta V, right? Well, actually, what they did is, uh, well, sorry, what I've done is I just solved this equation for V after, right? That's equal V park plus delta V. So I solved that equation for, for V after, and I got that my velocity after my delta V, uh, just through energy conservation, should be 11 kilometers a second, 11.2. Uh, as opposed to my, my initial velocity of 7.78. So if I then just solve for delta V, Right, I find uh, delta v with respect to the uh, the, the parking orbit uh, is three point four kilometers per second, and that gives us the, all the the delta v, all the energy we need to not only leave the sphere of influence of the Earth, but also to have an excess velocity of uh, two point five kilometers per second. Uh, which is actually fairly impressive, right? Why is it fairly impressive? Well, because, right, my delta V was only, right, 3.4 kilometers a second. And now not only is that enough to get me out of sphere of influence of the Earth, but after I leave, I still have an excess velocity of 2.5. And so it only took like 0.9 kilometers per second to leave the sphere of influence. Right. So again, the Oberth effect, right, is helping out a lot here. Oberth is helping. So the delta V to get on a path to Venus is only 3.4 kilometers per second. So this puts us on the path to Venus. Again, right, here's this map I gave in lecture eight or something like that, right, where you may recount, recall that, like, from a parking orbit, uh, it only took 3.9 kilometers per second to, it took uh, all of 3.9 kilometers per second to transition to geosynchronous. Right? Uh, so, right, 3.9 is obviously greater than 3.4, right? So it's easier to get to Venus than it is to uh, to get to geo. Wow, uh, so that's 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 fairly impressive, and that's due to the Oberth, right? Oberth effect. Uh, then, of course, right, uh, we can, uh, this, this is Mars. Uh, actually, this is like, this is cat, this includes capture velocity, I think, capture delta V. So if you're just doing a flyby, um, uh, your, your delta V is lower here. So that includes insertion into, the, into Mars orbit, right? So I forget exactly the numbers for delta V to Mars, uh, but uh, it's less than 
Right. Uh, now, so uh, again, this uh, light side, var dark side, the relative velocity uh, after you left the, uh, uh, the Earth's sphere of influence, right? Uh, whether you want that to be positive or negative. Right? So let's draw a picture here. Here's the sun. Uh, here's the orbit of the Earth. Right. And now for Venus, we want, here's the Earth, right? We want our velocity with respect to the Earth to be in the negative direction, opposite. So remember, the Earth is moving counterclockwise. Right? And so we want our velocity with respect to the Earth to be negative 2.5 kilometers per second. So that direction, this direction. Uh, now, the only trick here, how do you make it negative or positive? How do you choose whether it's negative or positive? Uh, so you're assuming you're in the ecliptic plane, right? So the only question is when you burn, right? So here's your parking orbit, right, in the ecliptic plane. Do you burn uh, here or do you burn here, right? Uh, so obviously if you burn here, right, then you're going to add to the, the velocity of the Earth. Actually, you would burn here because there's like a little time it takes. So you, there's some motion. But uh, uh, basically, if you burn here, you're adding to the velocity of the Earth. So delta V with respect to Earth is positive. And here, delta V uh, with respect to Earth is negative. And so uh, these are called light side, dark side maneuvers. Uh, so light side because you're on the side of the Earth. So th this, is, of course, assumes that your parking orbit is counterclockwise, which is always the case. Right? You would never have a parking orbit which would be retrograde. That would be crazy. Right? Uh, so uh, this point, right? Uh, right, right. This, right, which side where you do your burn is the light side versus the dark side. And the light side is, of course, the side that's on that's facing the sun. So this point, or actually this point, uh, and versus the dark side, which is over here. So anything on, on this side of the orbit is your dark side. Everything on this side is the light side. So if you're burning on the light side, uh, that means you want your delta V with respect to Earth to be less than zero. And here, that means you don't, in the dark side, you means your delta V uh, with respect to the Earth is positive. Right? So your uh, final velocity after you've left the sphere of influence uh, will be greater than the Earth's velocity if you burn on the dark side, and it will be uh, less than the Earth's velocity if you burn on the, on the light side. So if you're going to the outer planets, you burn on the dark side. And if you're going to the inner planets, you burn on the light side. All right. uh, so now we've covered uh, stages one, two, and three. Uh, this stage, relatively straightforward. And then we'll get to uh, arrival. Uh, one more, actually, uh, thing on departures I forgot. Uh, well, I didn't forget. I mentioned, but didn't get into the details. When, uh, because, right, there is some motion of this orbit, right, some, some turning, right? So if you're, that's your, if you just go in that velocity, right, that's your velocity after. Right, so the... You're in, a, you're in an elliptic orbit until you leave the sphere of influence. How much does that orbit change your velocity direction, right? So you can leave Earth at any time, of course, right? You could, you could leave it here. But if you want your velo final velocity to be in line with the velocity vector of the Earth, right? There's two points where you want to do it, right? So if, you're, if you want to burn on the light side, right? 
you want to burn uh, a little bit before you get to that earth sun vector. Uh, so you want that, uh, that angle there to be half of your turning. I remember hyperbolae, right? They have a, here's your planet, you have a turning angle, which kind of is the difference between your incoming and outgoing uh, velocity vectors. So here's your incoming, uh, that's your delta, right? Uh, in our case, right, it's sort of the same question, right? If we extend that out of the hyperbola, uh, except that now we are measuring it, we have um, those three angles, right? So from, um, okay, I'm gonna erase a few things. Go away, go away, go away, go away. So let's just continue out that hyperbola. Uh, here's the, so this doesn't exist, right? Doesn't exist. Uh, so this is your departure point, right? Uh, but uh, the point is, right, that your turning angle is this angle, delta, right? And so if we continued out this vector right through there, right, the, uh, the angle uh, that, uh, uh, so if, sorry, if we continue that vector out like that, perpendicular, right? The angle from your departure to the final angle is delta over two. Right? So it's half of that turning angle. Right? So you, uh, you turn a total of delta during a hyperbola, but we only get half of the hyperbola, so you only get half of the turn. So, uh, so our departure point should be make an angle of delta over two with the uh, the Earth Sun vector. Right. Uh, so, uh, how do you calculate delta? Right now, that's a question. So that depends on your eccentricity, right? Which we don't know yet. And so, the next question is how to calculate your eccentricity. Well, uh, first you calculate your semi-major axis of your departure orbit. You know the energy already, so it's relatively straightforward to solve this equation and get your semi-major axis. Right. Oops. So that number, just solve for that number right there. We already know what it is. And that gives us a semi-major axis of negative 96,000 kilometers. Notice the negative sign, right, because it's a hyperbola. Uh, now we plug that in. We know our periaps. Right, six, five, seven, eight. Right, uh, and then we uh, so we know the A, we just plug in for there, and we solve for eccentricity, and uh, that gives us a formula for eccentricity. And we solve for eccentricity, and it turns out our eccentricity is uh, 1.06 in this example. Uh, we plug that into the formula for turning angle, and that gives us a turning angle of 138 degrees. Uh, this angle we want to be delta over 2, so we want to leave 69.4 uh, degrees before we hit the Earth-Sun vector, which corresponds to uh, mid noon in, the, in our case. So that's the timing issue. Next, we get to uh, we transition through our home and transfer, and we, uh, we arrive at Venus, where we are faced with the opposite problem that we had before. Right. The opposite problem in that uh, we are, have some velocity with respect to Venus, and we, uh, we would like to enter Venus's orbit. Right. So it's, uh, it's really just the same calculations we had before. Uh, use energy conservation, right? Uh, transition through our patch point. Where we go from heliocentric to uh, Venus-centric inertial coordinate systems. 
right? So this is that transition, right? This this part right here. Those those lining things, right? So this is the uh, uh, velocity um, at arrival. That's v perigee, right? That's in uh, he heliocentric inertial. Now Venus is moving uh, at a velocity of Uh, v1 here. Right? And so our velocity in the uh, Venus centric coordinate systems is uh, the velocity in the heliocentric. Um, Minus uh, the velocity in the uh, in, in in the in, in of Venus in the heliocentric coordinate system. I think I got that right. Uh, so velocity of Venus um, uh, wait that's the, that's the velocity of Venus. And that's us. Not sure why I said P. Oh, perigee, periaps. Right. So we calculate our velocity after we patch into uh, the sphere of influence of Venus. So here's, uh, let's just draw Venus's sphere of influence here. Right. So our, we patch into Venus's sphere of influence. Now, do we arrive up here? Do we arrive down here? That's another question we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but our velocity with respect to Venus at the patch point is V infinity here, which is 2.7 kilometers per second. So that's because the v velocity of Venus is, uh, is uh, 35 kilometers a second. And our velocity at periapse, which we calculated earlier, uh, is 37 kilometers per second. And we calculated the velocity of Venus just because that's the velocity of anything in a sun-centered or, uh, orbit at the radius of Venus, circular. Right. Um, now, I want to notice that um, the magnitudes here matter, right? Uh, so our velocity at arrival at Venus, let's say here is Venus, right? Um, or actually, I guess I'm using this green for Venus, right? Their arrival at Venus. Uh, arrival at Venus is positive, right? In, the, in a positive direction. V with respect to Venus. So it's approaching Venus from the right. right. Uh, so obviously, right, uh, yeah, it had the, the positive direction is, is in, in that direction. Um, so the x direction is, is in the velocity vector of Venus. Anyway, uh, so approaching from the right, uh, which uh, otherwise known as the, the, uh, the back door. because it's uh, sort of the back, it's uh, the negative side. Right? Uh, so uh, we're approaching Venus from behind, so that's important. We're catching up with Venus. Venus is going slower than us, that's why uh, we're approaching Venus from behind. Right? Or it appears that we're approaching Venus from behind from the perspective of Venus. So now we're gonna insert into Venus orbit, right? Um, here's uh, the, the data we want. Uh, so first of all, uh, the mu of Venus, we need that information. Three, not 398600, for like for Earth, but very similar actually. Um, the, uh, we've got the, uh, the, the distance to Venus here. Um, we've got uh, the radius of Venus, so like 6378, but 6187. Venus is very actually very close to Earth in many ways. A uh, little bit smaller, but not much. So again, we're approaching from the back door.
right? Uh, we're approaching Venus from behind. Um, we want to establish a posi-grade orbit, which means counterclockwise. Right. So that means actually we want to, so if we approached from the light side of Venus uh, versus the dark side, because this is the sun over here. So if you approach on the light side, we would be moving in a clockwise direction, a retrograde orbit. And if we approach from the dark side, we'll be moving in a counterclockwise direction. Notice these are reversed, actually, uh, if you approach from the front door, right? So this is the case where we approach from the front door, right? Uh, that would be when we're going to an outer planet. The light side, the dark side. Oops, and you can't see any of that. Uh, how do I? Is there a way to just move all that stuff? Probably. Like a selection tool. Um, I don't know. If, let's see. Yeah, whatever. I'll just. Draw it again. Or I can just, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'll draw it again. Right, so uh, the case of, uh, of uh, outer planets is different. In that case, uh, let's see, here's our planet. Here's the sun, sorry. Um, and the, in the outer planets, you're approaching from uh, the front door. Right? And uh, there's the light side. This is the dark side. And so for a uh, clockwise orbit, you approach on the dark side. For a counterclockwise orbit, you approach on the light side. Right. So the, it's just reversed, right? If you want a retrograde or posigrade orbit. So anyway, we want a posigrade orbit. We're approaching from the back door, so we choose this one. Because right. uh, we want posigrade. Anyway, um, what else? So we also want a, a circular orbit. We want a circular rise. We want a periapse, or so we want to our point of closest approach. We want that to be six six seven eight, or six six eight seven. Sorry. Um, and so, uh, how how do we make sure that our point of closest approach is six six eight seven? That's a, that's the next question. Um, no. In the outer planets, right? We're going slower than the planet. They're uh, they're catching up to us. All right, so at arrival at Venus, we want a patch point, or we want to an insertion point. At a radius of six six eight seven, right? Uh, okay, how do we calc How do we? Well, remember how do we do that? Remember the formula for periapse, right? A one minus e, that's equal to six six eight seven. We're on a hyperbolic incoming uh, trajectory. Uh, we can calculate our in V infinity with respect to Venus. We already did that. It was um, something or other. Um, uh, 2.71. 
right? And so we can calculate our energy, which is positive, right? Because it's a hyperbola. And so uh, we can just use the energy equation, right? Uh, for uh, a hyperbola to calculate uh, the semi-major axis of our orbit, right? This is only determined by energy, right? And can't be changed, right? Basically fixed. Well, except for except by a delta v. Okay, so we've got that piece of information here. Can't change. On a new color. Right, that's fixed. Uh, so what do we? Have, how can we then get our desired radius of perigee? Well, we can play with eccentricity. We can change that without delta v. How you may ask? We'll come back to that. So anyway, but I mean, we I, we just calculate our desired eccentricity of 1.15 for to get to achieve our desired periaps. Right. So how do we get that uh, that that eccentricity? How do we get that eccentricity of 1.15? Uh, we do that by controlling the geometry at the patch point. So specifically, uh, when you're really far out uh, away from a planet, right? so your planet's still very far away, and you're approaching from like way over here, Right. Um, so basically, this is a line, right? V infinity, um, and oops, no, that's not a very good line. Uh, and basically, you can make very small changes way out here, very small changes in flight path, which when amplified out way over here have very large result in very large changes with respect to how close you approach the planet or as we call it the targeting radius So at very at infinity, right, right, this y is delta, right. You can approach sort of the distance of your asymptotic trajectory uh, away from the planet. So you could miss the planet entirely if you wanted, right? You just make a little correction. You just like fly, fly the planet. And the planet doesn't even notice you. So you can make that that in, that inflection is is as large or as small as you like by controlling this targeting radius, right? And how does that work mechanically? Right, uh, it works through angular momentum, right? Because the angular momentum is very simple to calculate for this problem, right? Uh, h is just the velocity at infinity, which doesn't change, times uh, moment arm, right? Which is delta, so it's just targeting radius times v infinity. Now this you can't change, but this you can. And control that targeting radius. And so what does that give us? Right. Well, it gives us total control over angular momentum. Right. So angular momentum right, is just delta times v infinity. Right. So it gives us, no matter what our v infinity is, through some choice of targeting radius, we can get that desired angular momentum. Angular momentum is rated, well, through you know, mu, mu v, which is fixed. Uh, is related to uh, the semi-lattice rectum here, uh, which is then controls for a fixed uh, for a fixed a 
right? Blue means fixed. Uh, it controls uh, eccentricity. So if we just solve this equation uh, for for delta, right? We just we, we solve for delta. We get is delta in terms of all of these other things, right? Uh, the infinity, which is fixed, a is fixed, mu v is fixed, and e, which is what we want. So for desired e, we can find our desired delta. So for any given eccentricity, we can find the appropriate targeting radius. Okay. And this works for any, right? Anyway. Right, so, uh, so now uh, we basically have all our ducks in a row. Uh, we've got our uh, velocity at periapse, uh, which is fixed. Uh, we can find uh, the, uh, uh, through the vis viva equation, right? We, A is fixed, mu is fixed that we've determined that, determined everything is fixed. So we can, we've got a fixed velocity at periapse, right? Uh, and then we want to inject into a circular orbit, right? The circular orbit at that same radius has a velocity of 6.97 kilometers per second. And again, we want to use the Oberth effect to do all our delta V maneuvers at the periapse. And so we just calculate a delta V maneuver at the periapse, which is the difference between a circular orbit at that radius and how fast we're coming in. So let me, uh, so there's a brown planet, right? We're coming in, we arrive at the periapse of uh, 10.2 kilometers per second. Uh, we do a retrograde burn of delta v equals 3.25 kilometers per second. And our uh, after that happens, we have a velocity here of v equals uh, basically 7 kilometers per second, which is the velocity of a circular orbit. So, um, right, 3.25 kilometers per second. So a, actually a fairly big delta V uh, necessary to, uh, to get into, uh, uh, into that circular orbit. Um, so circularizing your orbit at arrival is almost as expensive as departing in the first place, which is unfortunate. Um, However, that's not necessarily the minimum delta V for capture. So we can actually calculate the minimum delta V for capture. So, so that you don't get in a hyperbolic flyby. So that's the case where you just, all you want is your energy is zero, basically. So, uh, um, with respect to Venus. So you're in some kind of elliptic orbit, very high eccentricity orbit. Um, the, in that case, uh, the, uh, we replace uh, this 10.2 with 9.8. It's not buying us a lot, but, but that's okay. Um, and so actually in this case, uh, we get uh, that the uh, injection Velocity is 0.36. Where did I get that? Ew, my bad. Um, so let me let me just take back my last few seconds. Uh, so actually, uh, <laughs> my my bad. Uh, so the um, uh, the velocity you arrive at is 10.2. And the velocity corresponding to a zero energy orbit is 9.87, right? right? So that's what you want. So you replace this number with this number, and then you do this di difference. And in fact, you only need a delta V of 0.36 uh, 
five three uh, to to inject into orbit. And that's the minimum delta v we need for capture. Yeah. So again, almost almost nothing, right? Almost nothing. And that's again because of the Oberth effect. You're able to use an Oberth effect. You might even be able to, if this was Venus or even Mars, Mars has some atmosphere, you can actually get, uh, uh, this is so low, you could possibly just use aero capture to get into, er, into Venus or Mars orbit. And that's where you just dip below the, uh, the atmosphere uh, a little bit that gives you a delta v of say uh, 0.4 kilometers per second, and that's enough to uh, to put you in in orbit. Right. Now, to be honest, uh, let's see, ne aero capture has never actually been used. Uh, I think there was one case in 2010, but basically, it's 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 it's, it's very promising, but you know, um, uh, it's it's very dangerous especially because we don't have um, very detailed models of the atmosphere of these planets. Now we do for Earth, so we have used air braking maneuvers extensively on Earth, right? Anytime basically you go to the moon, right? You, you re-enter re the Earth, right? They've been used since the beginning of the space program for Earth. Uh, but any other planet uh, is, uh, is just, it, there's no humans involved, it's, it's, it's dangerous. So we don't use aero, we've never really used aero capture on other planets quite yet. I got a little music on. So this is just a, an illustration of the, uh, an aero capture maneuver uh, for Mars, right? Uh, so this is uh, basically, you dip into the atmosphere a little bit, just skim the atmosphere, because Remember, Mars doesn't have much atmosphere. And then you just do it again and again and again. And eventually, remember, that uh, perturbation due to uh, atmospheric drag can be useful, right? Again, bringing back those orbital perturbations. Right. So... Uh, again, they cut both ways. Uh, 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 those orbital perturbations give us our sphere of influence model. They allow for aero capture. Um, so the, they're, they're, they, they all always have positives and negatives. All right. So I just uh, conclude this uh, sort of part here uh, with a uh, sort of this patched conic approximation. Here we're going to Mercury. Um, this is the messenger probe. It's very complicated orbital maneuvers. So there's one maneuver there in deep space, and then you got to get the timing right and pass by Venus, which is like a D uh, gravity assist. And we'll talk about gravity assist in the next section of this lecture, which I probably won't get to tonight. Uh, and then we have a, a couple of smaller targeting maneuvers. Those deep space maneuvers are targeting maneuvers. They're not really delta V maneuvers. Um, and so we get some uh, a couple of these deep space maneuvers, and we're going to do another flyby of, of Mercury again. This is not an aero capture, but it's a, do a little delta V close to the surface and and and, and get into the capture. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else do I got in this section. Right. And then just, here's just our mapping out. Right, this is uh, uh, here. Right. Remember, this is uh, this is to, to insert, so it's that three point four plus the uh, the capture, right? So the the uh, the, the like point five or whatever it is for. Uh, I guess it must be a little bit more for for Mars. Um, so this is capture includes capture here. Uh, and then of course, uh, once you're in capture, right? If you want to get into a circular orbit, that's uh, another one point four kilometers per second. Uh, if you want to go to Deimos, there's some maneuvers around here. If you want to land, that's another 4.1 kilometers per second. So uh, all, again, pod going both ways. That's why the arrows just go both ways, is because uh, the delta Vs getting out and getting back in are essentially the same. All right, so I'm, uh, at this point, I'm going to pause again, um, give you a chance to recuperate. And when I come back, I will talk about the last part, which will be relatively brief, on gravity assist maneuvers. <laughs>